Dead Secret 7 by Enid Blyton. Dramatized by Edward Phillips. There hadn't been a meeting of the Secret 7 Society for ages, and Peter thought that he really must call one soon. It was true that nothing much had happened lately, but it would never do to let the society come to an end. But you can't solve mysteries unless there are some to solve, thought Peter, so we'll have to think up something useful to do till an adventure comes along. He called a meeting for the very next day, immediately after school. His mother suggested that all the members should have tea first, and Peter's sister Janet had carried everything down to the shed which was their headquarters. There were two enormous jugs of hot cocoa, and ranged on a shelf behind were seven plates of food, which Janet checked carefully. Honey sandwiches, sardine sandwiches, buttered buns, doughnuts, a chocolate cake baked today, and a jam sponge sandwich. I think that should be enough, Peter, don't you? <coughs> oh, here they come. It's Pam and Barbara, and Colin's with them. Password. Uh, I'm most awfully sorry, Peter, but it's such ages since we had a meeting that we'd forgotten it. Oh, well, it's Jack Spratt, but come in anyway. Thanks. I'm sorry about the password. It's all right. We ought to choose a new one anyway. Password! Jack, Jack Spratt. Spratt! Hello. What's the meeting about? Anything special? No, nothing's turned up, worse luck. But we can't let our society fizzle out because we wait and wait for something to happen. We'll talk about that later. Pour out the cocoa, Janet, and remember that we all like heaps of sugar. Help yourself, and while we're eating, we'll start. It's not a very important meeting, but we've got quite a bit to discuss and plan. If this Secret Seven hasn't any particular job to work on, it's got to find other things to do. Do you agree, members? Yes! Right, now, I don't suppose anybody has heard of anything peculiar or mysterious or extraordinary that we could look into, have they? Well, we have to do something, something to keep up our interest until an adventure comes along. Yes, but what do you mean, Peter? We can't make things happen. No, I know that, but we can put in a bit of practice. What, for instance? Well, we could practice shadowing people, and we might perhaps have a shot at disguising ourselves, just to see if we could get away with it. How could we? We're only children. We can't wear false beards or ragged clothes or pretend to walk with limps or anything. We'd be spotted at once. Well, perhaps that's not a frightfully good idea. We'll leave that for a minute. But we could practice spotting somebody and then writing down a very clear description of him so as to get practice at that kind of thing. It's always useful to be able to describe a thief in great detail, for instance. But how do we know who's a thief? We don't, but that doesn't matter. We just go to the railway station, say, and sit down on a seat. We watch the people standing there waiting for a train. We pick on somebody, it doesn't matter who. We look at them carefully and memorise everything about them. Then, when they've gone, we write down what we've remembered. It would be very good practice for observing people. Sounds rather dull to me. I'd much sooner do some shadowing or something. Anyway, I'm not much good at describing anything. I'm always bottoming composition at school. I just can't think of anything to say. All right, you can do the shadowing. Colin, you'd better do the same. Perhaps the girls would be better at spotting people and describing them. Go to the station or the bus stop. Anywhere will do. Jack, you and I will do a bit of spying. We'll find a good spying place, sit there and watch what goes on without being seen. It will be good practice for when we really have to do it. How do we do the shadowing? We'd be seen following anybody in broad daylight. We'll do it in the dark then, but don't go shadowing anyone together, you and Colin, or you'll be spotted at once and that would be silly. Go separately, choose someone you see, and follow them to their home without being seen. I'd rather tackle a real mystery than mess about practising. George, you never know when we might stumble on something when we're putting a bit of practice in. We'd practise our observation stunt on Saturday morning. I'll go to the railway station. I always like that. It's nice and busy. I'll go to the bus stop. And I'll come with you, Pam. Right. Now we've all got secret jobs to do, and they'll keep us going till something turns up. 
Jack, I'll let you know when I've thought of a good place for us to hide and keep watch on any goings-on nearby. Now for homework. I wish I'd listened a bit better in class this morning. I haven't the faintest idea how to do those sums we were set. George wasn't at all happy with his shadowing job at first, but the more he thought about it, the more interested he became. He decided to start right away, and when he got home from the meeting, he put on a pair of rubber shoes so that he wouldn't make any noise. He also put on a dark overcoat so that he wouldn't be seen in the shadows, and he even blacked his face. He looked most peculiar. He decided to slip out of the back door. If his mother caught sight of him, she would have a fit. He also took with him a rubber truncheon that he had had for Christmas. Now he could really pretend to be a policeman. The truncheon looked exactly like a real one, but was only made of thin brown rubber. He crept downstairs and out of the garden door, went down the path to the back gate and came out quietly into the dark street. He went along cautiously, keeping to the shadows and swinging his rubber truncheon. The only question was, who was he to shadow? There didn't seem to be anybody about. Wait a minute, though. Was this the bus coming? Yes, it was. Good. It would set some passengers down and he could shadow one of them home. The bus pulled into the stop and George saw some black shadows moving as people stepped down from it. Somebody was walking towards him. George pressed himself back into a hedge and waited. The man was a tall, stooping fellow wearing a bowler hat and carrying a bag. As he passed... George came out from the bushes and began to follow him, keeping well into the darkness of the trees. Down the road to the corner, round the corner, carefully and cautiously, there was the man ahead of him, halfway down the road. George trotted on after him. He decided to get a little nearer so that he could see exactly where the man lived when he went into his house. He quickened his pace, his eyes on the stooped figure ahead of him. But, unfortunately, he was so anxious not to lose sight of the man that he completely forgot to check behind him. And then, suddenly... Just what do you think you're doing, creeping along in the dark like that? I, I, What's I, this you've got on your wrist? A truncheon? Don't tell me you meant to use no. it, you wicked little scoundrel. And why is your face backed up? Are you one of those little hooligans who think they can attack innocent people and rob them and... Of take course them? I'm not. Let me go. I'm just shadowing somebody for, well, just for practice, that's all. So you are up to no good. I followed you right from the bus, you little wretch. I watched you hiding here and there, creeping round corners, following that old fellow with a bag. Come along with me. I'm taking you to the police station. Oh, please don't do that. My mother would be so upset. Take me home. I'll tell you my name and address and come with you, and I can explain everything there. Well, all right. I'll take you home and have a word with your father. What you need is a good hiding. On Monday evening, immediately after school, there was a special emergency meeting of the Secret Seven. They all knew what it was about. It was about George. I expect Peter's told you everything that happened. It was just, well, bad luck, that's all. I went out on shadowing practice and I got caught. I now resign from the Secret Seven. Oh, oh no. no! Here's my badge. Thank you for letting me belong. I think that's silly. I'm very, very sorry to go, but Dad says I must. In fact, he insists on it. I'm to have nothing more to do with the society. Well, I think it's horrid of him. No, he's not horrid. It was that man's fault. He caused all the trouble, making such a fuss about me. He knew I wasn't doing any harm. Who was he, George? Do you know? No idea. I'd never seen him before. When Dad asked him for his dress, he said he'd just arrived and was staying at that little hotel called the Starling. He didn't give his name. I've a good mind to go and find out who he is and tell him what I think of him. Yes, that's a good idea. You and Colin and me will go, Jack. It's the least we can do for poor old George. I must say, I couldn't understand why he had to be so jolly interfering. Even when I told him who I was and where I lived, he was just as mean. Starling's Hotel. I'll just write that down in my notebook. Well, go and ask for him and tell him he's done a jolly mean thing. What are you going to do about the Secret Seven, Peter? I mean, you're only six now I'm out of it. Will you be the Secret Six? No. We began as the Secret Seven and we'll go on as the Secret Seven. You can't just suddenly change a society as important as ours. Well, you'll have to get a seventh then. I shall hate that. Who will you get? Lenny? Richard? No. 
Hadn't we better all put up somebody's name and then vote on it? That's if we've got to have someone else. I shan't much like anyone in George's place. You will like the one I'm all thinking of, I promise you. Who is this? Is it? He's with us here tonight. But he will only be a temporary member just till we get George back again. Because I'm determined to go and find that man and make him go and ask George's parents to let George belong to the Secret Seven again. But who is the temporary member? There's nobody here but us. It's Scamper! <laughs> Scamper, will you please be a proper member of the Secret Seven till we get George back? Well, Scamper's the only person I don't mind taking my place. He's always really belonged to the Secret Seven anyway. I hope I can come back. But I don't feel so bad now that Scamper's a temporary seventh member. Good old Scamper. Pin the badge on his collar, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I'd better go and let you get on with your meeting. Good luck, everybody. Hope to see you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye. George. Bye. Now, we'd better hear how the rest of us got on with our special jobs. Janet, you first. Well, I was at the railway station, and I picked out two people to observe as they passed. They came off the 1013 train from Pilbury. First, an old woman with a round face, a big nose with a wart at one side, and grey curly hair. She wore a green coat with a belt, a hat with lots of red cherries round it. Mrs. Mrs. Lawson! Yes, quite right. I chose her just to see if I could describe her well enough for you to recognise. Now, the second person I chose was a bit peculiar. A very stoopy man who walked a bit lame, had an old soft hat pulled well down over his face, a funny hand... What do you mean, a funny hand? Well, I don't know what was the matter with it. It looked as if two fingers were missing, and it was sort of deformed and crooked. His hat was too low to see the colour of his hair, and he had no tie or scarf. Do you think you would recognise him if you saw him? Right, oh, I'll say. Jolly good, Janet. Now, Barbara and Pam, what about you? Well, we didn't see anybody interesting, really. Not interesting enough to make a note of. Well, you wouldn't be a bit of use if we were really trying to find out something. It's not our fault. We did our best. Never mind. What about you, Colin? Well, I didn't see anyone at first, and it began to rain, and I was pretty fed up. But then, a man with a dog came along. I thought he must be taking it out for an evening walk, but he didn't seem to like it very much. It kept whining and pulling away from him. I couldn't see what the dog was like at first because it was too dark. But then, when the man and the dog walked under a street lamp, I saw that it was a bull terrier. A beauty, a real beauty. Well, I shadowed the man and the dog, and it was really pretty easy because the man was so much taken up with the dog, having to drag it along, that he hadn't time to notice me at all. Well, what happened then? I followed them down Hartley Street and across King Square and into a little dark alley that led between some big buildings. I went down the alley cautiously because I couldn't see my way very well and dared switch on my torch. Was the man there? Well, that's the funny thing, Jack. I went right down the alley and just as I was nearly at the end, I heard the man coming back. I knew it was him because he had the same kind of quick dry cough my granddad has and he was coughing as he came. What did you do? I squashed myself into a doorway, and the man walked right by me without seeing me. But he hadn't got the dog with him. I wondered where he had put it, and why he had gone down there and come straight back again. So I went to the end of the alley and switched on my torch. And was the dog there? No. The alley led into a little yard surrounded entirely by high walls. It was a messy place full of rubbish, old boxes, crates, broken crockery, sacks, all sorts of things. It was very quiet, completely enclosed, and no way out but the alley. I flushed my torch all around, expecting to see the dog somewhere, tied up perhaps, or even in a kennel. But there wasn't a sign of it. Where was it then? That's what I still don't know. I looked absolutely everywhere. I listened and I called softly, but no, not a growl, not a whine, not a movement. And as I told you, there was no way out of that yard except the alley. But a dog just can't disappear into thin air. No, it certainly can't. There's something very strange about this, Colin. And the funny thing is, Jack and I saw a man with a dog too. Only it was a poodle, not a bull terrier. 
We found a spy hole in a thick clump of leafy twigs springing out around the trunk of an elm tree. They hid us beautifully. We sat there, peeping through the leaves, and at first we didn't see anything. But then a car came along and stopped just near us. A man got out with a dog. A magnificent grey poodle, fluffy in patches and bare in patches. You know how poodles look. The dog was terribly frightened, I thought. We thought it was only car sick. It didn't like going back into the car, though it whined like anything and pulled away from the man as hard as it could. He was pretty rough with it, I thought. I suppose the poor thing knew it would be car sick again. Well, your report doesn't seem very interesting, Peter. Did you take the car's number? I bet you didn't. As it happens, we did. It was PSD 188L. PSD? Pretty sick dog. That's easy enough to remember. Yes, that's good. <laughs> did you see what the man looked like? No, it was too dark for that, and we weren't all that close. Well, I think Colin's story is the most interesting, and there may well be something worth looking into there. I vote a couple of us go down tomorrow evening and take a look at that yard. What a pity George isn't in this too. Peter, do go to that hotel and tell that man he's got to go and tell George's parents there to let him join the Secret Seven again. He'd be so upset when he knows we may be mixed up in something strange again and he won't be there to share in it. All right. We'll go tomorrow, after school, and then we'll go and explore that yard. So, after school the next afternoon, Colin, Jack and Peter set off for Starling's Hotel. It was rather a run-down place, and the woman at the reception desk was not at all friendly. She said there was only one guest who had recently arrived at the hotel, a Mr. Taylor, and she directed them into the lounge. As they entered, Taylor looked up with a scowl on his face. What do you want? It's about George, our friend. The boy you caught the other night. You thought he was up to no good, but actually he was only putting in a bit of shadowing practice. <laughs> he belonged to our secret society, you see. Now his parents have told him he can't be a member anymore. Well, he's got nothing to do with me. <clears throat> he shouldn't play the fool. He wasn't. I tell you, we're a very well-known society around these parts. The police know us very well. We've helped them many a time. What are you talking about? You ring up Inspector Harris and ask about us. Well, whether you're friends with the police or not, I'm not having any more to do with George or whatever his name is. <clears throat> so that's that. He's got no right to shadow people, no matter what the reason is. <clears throat> now clear out, all of you. Do you have a dog? What? No, I haven't got a dog. What's it got to do with you anyway? Now get out of here and leave me alone. <clears throat> all right, we're going. Come on, chaps. It's obviously no use appealing to his better nature. And don't let me catch you around here again. If I hear you've been hanging around this hotel, I'll make you wish you'd never been born. Gosh, wasn't a pleasant man. Yes, as soon as I saw him, I knew he was the kind of fellow that likes to get people into trouble. Colin, why did you ask him if he had a dog? Because that was the same man that I saw the other night. The one with the disappearing dog. What? Are you sure? Positive. And he said he didn't have a dog. This is getting more and more mysterious. Let's get round to that yard and see if we can find anything there that might give us a clue as to what's going on. It took them a quarter of an hour to get to King's Square, for Starling's Hotel was away at the other end of the town. They crossed the square and made their way cautiously down the alley to the yard. It was enclosed by high walls and overlooked by one or two dusty little windows. Peter hoped that no one would suddenly open a window and yell to them to clear out. They turned that yard upside down, growing bolder as nobody disturbed them. They looked absolutely everywhere, in all the nooks and crannies, under every box and crate. They searched the walls carefully, looking for a door into one of the neighbouring buildings. There were none. And in the end, they stopped and looked at each other in bewilderment. There was absolutely nowhere that dog could be hiding and no way it could have got out of the yard. Well, I don't know, Colin. There's everything here but the dog. Are you absolutely certain this is the right yard? I'm positive. I recognise the doorway there in the alley where I hid when that man came past. 
And I remember that pile of old boxes and that rusty pram. Well, we've looked into every crate and box and every corner where a dog could be, and there's no sign of it. Though I doubt if any dog would keep quiet if he heard us rummaging about. Hang on a minute, Jack. Shine your torch down here, by this big tea chest. Well, I'm blowed. Look at that. What is it? It's an iron lid, probably the lid of a coal hole. We nearly missed it in the dark. Yes, but I don't see what... Colin, it's the lid of a coal hole. That means that underneath here there's a coal cellar. So that's how it was done. It's a big hole, plenty big enough to take a dog, even a large one. You mean the dog was pushed down into the coal cellar? I'll bet you anything you like that's what's happened. Let's get that lid up and take a look down there. It's been moved recently. It's not as caked with dirt around the edges as it should be. But why push a dog down through a coal hole? What an extraordinary thing to do. Come on, give me a hand to shift it. Now then, let's have a look. And in the end, they stopped and looked at each other in bewilderment. There was absolutely nowhere that dog could be hiding, and no way it could have got out of the yard. It's as black as a, well, as black as a coal hole down there. Can't see a thing. Hand me a torch, Jack. Here you are. Thanks. Nothing. No sign of a dog or any coal or coke either. Just a dark, horrible, deep hole. Anyone care to jump down and take a look? No, no thanks. I must say I agree with you. It goes down a very long way. It would be silly to risk it. Come on, we'd better put the lid back on. I'm not sure I like this nasty, lonely little yard now it's getting dark. Wait a minute. I've got an idea. What is it? Colin, what on earth are you putting your head down the coal hole for? <laughs> Did you hear that? The dog is down there. And several others, too, by the sound of it. They heard my whistle and they barked. Far away somewhere, but they barked all right. So that fella did push the dog down in the cellar, and probably several more besides. Now I wonder why he did that. Well, anyway, let's put the lid back now. We don't want anyone to suspect that we've stumbled on some part of their secret. We'd better get going back home. My mother will be wondering where I am. Peter, one of these buildings has a lighted window. Do you suppose the coal cellar belongs to that one? It's impossible to tell, Jack. But even if it did, it might not have anything to do with the dogs. Well, it wouldn't hurt to take a look. If we could find out what sort of place it is, it might just possibly give us a clue. All right. The building with the lighted window should be the one on the left-hand corner of the alley. Let's just take a look on the way back. If it is an office of some sort, there should be a sign on the door. sack manufacturers. What on earth does that mean? Well, that certainly doesn't tell us very much. I don't think there's anything more we can do here tonight, Peter. Let's get back. Wait a minute. Quick, get back into the shop doorway. What's up? There's someone coming out of that building. Keep in the shadows now or he'll see us. There he goes. He's crossing to the bus stop. Peter, do you notice anything familiar about him? Yes, I think... Hang on, here comes the bus. Where does that bus say it's going to go to? Can you see? Pilbury, and the man's getting on. Peter, did he notice his hand when he put it out to take hold of the bus rail? No. Why? It was sort of crooked, and there were two fingers missing. Don't you remember? 
remember. Janet's report. Of course. Colin thought he looked familiar. It was that man she described getting off the train from Pilbury. Hatwell pulled down over his eyes, walked a bit lame, and a funny hand. It all fits. He's the same man. But wait a bit. There's nothing extraordinary about our seeing the same man as Janet, is there? I mean, it's just a coincidence, that's all. Yes, you're probably right. Still, I can't help feeling there's some connection between everything we've seen. If only we could work out what it is. I think this calls for a special meeting of the Secret Seven. Tomorrow, after tea, usual place. We'll pull all of our information and see if we can't come up with any answers. And so, members, that's all we know for certain so far. We know there's a dog down in the cellar and probably others as well. We know that the man with a funny hand probably works in the building on the corner of the yard. We think we know that the man at Starlings pushed the dog down the coal hole and that he may have put the others down there as well. Now, where do we go from here? I think that the man you saw getting on the bus was definitely the same one I saw at the station. He probably lives at Pilbury. I saw him getting off the train from Pilbury, and you saw him getting on the bus for Pilbury. Though I can't see that it's all important to know where he lives. He may not have anything to do with this affair at all. That's what we thought. Do you suppose there's anybody down in the coal cellar looking after the dogs? Well, there must be. There wouldn't be any sense in starving them. I think the dogs must be stolen ones. Colin saw one of them. You said it was a fine bull terrier, Colin. So it's probably very valuable and would fetch a fair bit of money. Gosh, you don't suppose that cellar's full of purebred dogs, all stolen? Why don't we look up the lost and found advertisements in the newspapers and see if any dogs are advertised as lost or stolen? Now that's a very good idea, Pam. And we could go to the police station and look at the notices outside. They often have posters giving particulars of lost animals. Excellent. Any more ideas? Well, I think we just have to explore that cellar. I did wonder if we could try to get into that building with the lighted window and see if its cellar led to the coal hall. But we can't do that. It's called breaking and entering, and you can get into the most frightful trouble for it. No, what we'll do is this. You, Colin, and you, Jack, will come with me and scamper to the coal hall tonight. And, Colin, you bring that rope ladder from your garden shed. We can use it to get down the coal hall. Bring torches, both of you, and wear rubber shoes. Pam and Barbara, you hunt through every paper you can get hold of and see if there are any valuable dogs advertised as lost or stolen. Janet, you can go and look outside the police station and see if there are any notices there. And, as it's fairly near George's house, you can go and tell him the latest news. He may not be a proper member at the moment, but that's not his fault, and he deserves to know what's going on, even if he can't join in. Right, you've all got your jobs to do. Good luck. The following afternoon, after school, Janet called round at the police station and then went on to George's house. George was absolutely delighted to see her. He had been feeling considerably left out of things over the past few days, and he listened eagerly to everything Janet had to say. So all in all, it was quite a useful meeting. Pam and Barbara called in at the library at lunchtime this afternoon to look at the newspapers, and they found three advertisements about lost dogs, a pedigree greyhound, a purebred bull terrier, and an Alsatian. And the addresses are all quite close. We think the thief or thieves, either sell the dogs or claim the reward. There was a reward of £20 offered for the Alsatian. I didn't find any notices about dogs at the police station, but there was one interesting one about a man that the police wanted to find. I wrote it down. John Wilfred Pace, aged 71, small and bent, bald, shaggy eyebrows and beard, very hoarse voice. Shuffles badly when walking. Scar across the right cheek. I should know him all right if I saw him. Well, that's about all for the moment, George. We're all missing you very much and hoping you'll soon be back with us. I'll let you know if anything else exciting happens. Bye for now. 
all this going on and I'm not in on it. But why shouldn't I be on it? Why shouldn't I go down to the yard tonight and watch the others going down the coal hole? If I keep well hidden, they needn't even know I'm there. I may not be an official member of the Secret Seven anymore, but I'm not going to miss out on all the fun. Yes, that's what I'll do. I'll wait until it gets dark and then I'll... At just after seven o'clock that same evening, Peter, Jack, Colin and Scamper were standing in the cellar directly beneath the coal hole in the yard. They had got down quite easily with the aid of Colin's rope ladder, and Peter and Jack had managed to get Scamper down too, much to his surprise and puzzlement. They found themselves in a gloomy underground room, so large that the beams of their torches couldn't penetrate into the furthest dark corners. I only hope that man doesn't come along again tonight. He's only got to pop that lid on and we're trapped. We couldn't possibly lift it from the inside. Now there must be a way out of this cellar. Let's take a look round. Is that a door over there? Yes, and there's another one over there. There's one over here too. Which one do we take? Scamper, come back. Where are you going? <coughs> He's gone to the door at the top of those stairs. Do you think he's heard something? <coughs> Why are you scratching at the door? There's something in there, all right. But it can't be anything dangerous, or he'd be barking. Come on, let's take a look. <coughs> My golly, look at this. There must be five, six dogs at least here, and they're all shut up in cages. I say, look. There's a classic poodle we saw the other night. I'm sure it's the same one. Then there's a bull terrier. See? I think it's the same one I saw with the man. There's a greyhound and a magnificent Alsatian. I bet those are the ones the girls read about in the papers. And here's a Dalmatian. Hello, Spots. You're a beauty, aren't you? What do we do now? We set them free and see if we can get them out of the coal hole. We'd never get them up the rope ladder, and I bet they'd begin to fight if we set them free. Look, there's a light switch. Ah, oh, that's better. Now I can see what we're doing. Quiet. Listen, somebody's coming. Quick, hide in here behind the cages. See if all the naughty ladies are all right. I <laughs> uh, don't think nothing of the likes of you and me. <laughs> but we don't care, do we? Well, my eye and mighty ones, we're worse off than little Tinker here. You lost your old masters, but he's still got his. <laughs> you may be worth your weight in gold, but you give all you got for a nice long walk, wouldn't you? <laughs> What's the matter, Tinker? What are you doing behind those cages? What are you feeling, rat? Oh, wow, wow. More visitors. Coming out. It's no use trying to hide. Tinker spotted you. <laughs> Who are you? What are you doing here? Well, where did all these dogs come from? Why are you keeping them down here? Oh, I don't know where they come from. It just comes and goes, comes and goes. They comes in at that coal hole back there and they, they goes out up them stairs. What's he got to do with you? What are you doing down here anyway? If the governor catches you down here, you'll be for it. You just wait. He, he, he should be along any minute now. What's going on here, Pace? You know, uh, visitors, governor. Three young lads and, and another dog. Ah, visitors, eh? Trespassing, were you? Snooping about where you don't belong? All right, we know how to deal with trespassers. Pace, open the Alsatian's cage. All right. All right, come on, Ripper. Come on, boy, keep an eye on them. That's right, good boy. Now, you three, you say exactly where you are. You see my hand, the one with two fingers off? Well, that's what an Alsatian did to me when I moved while he was guarding me. Now then, do you know what happens to boys who poke their noses into things that don't concern them? Huh? Well, you soon will. Pace, open up that big cage at the end. All right, Ripper, round them up. Into the cage with them. 
Right. That takes care of you. Pace, yeah. I'm taking the dogs in the car. It's too dangerous to leave them here now. I don't know how much these kids have found out or whether anyone knows they're here, but I can't take the risk. Unlock the cages now and let the other dogs out. Uh, all right. If anyone comes around asking questions, you know nothing. Just play the idiot. <laughs> Should be easy for you. I, I, I'm afraid of the place. Well, hide away in the cellars. It's a warren of a place down there. No one will ever find you. Let these kids out in 24 hours' time. I'll be well away by then, so it doesn't matter what kind of tale they tell. They can't prove anything anyway. Right, is that the last one? Yes, Governor. Good, I'm off then. And remember, you know nothing. Come on then. Come on, boys. Come on, let's go. I told you, didn't I? No, you're in a right mess. Shows you right. I don't like boys, nasty, tormenting creatures. I always said as they did ought to be shut up in cages, and now here you be, locked in my cages, and nobody knows where you are. And shall I tell you something else? If so be as the police come after me and take me, I'll not tell them about you. <laughs> if poor old John Pace is going to be shut up, then, then you can stay shut up too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, now we're properly caught. What a horrible old man. Yes, just when we've almost sorted this mystery out, we can't do a thing about it. We know now why that man brings the dogs down here, and we know who looks after them. Pace, the man whose description Janet saw outside the police station. And the man with the funny hand is mixed up in it. He's probably the boss. The question now is, how are we going to get out of here? I say, has anybody seen Scamper? No, I haven't seen him since the man with the funny hand came in. I wonder where he could have got to. You don't suppose that man took him with the other dogs, do you? I don't think so. He couldn't have got out the door at the top of the stairs because it's been closed all the time except when the man came and went. But the other door's still open and... Shh! Listen! There's somebody else coming. I heard something, I'm sure. I hope it's not that man. It would be just our luck if he came along with another dog and... Quiet! Whoever he is, he's coming this way. Hello? Peter, Jack, Colin, are you there? It's George. <laughs> and Scamper. George, what on earth are you doing here? There you are. What are you doing in that cage? George, I've never been so pleased to see anyone in all my life. But what are you doing here, George? I knew you were coming down here tonight because Janet told me. I thought I'd come too, even though I don't belong to the Secret Seven anymore. I thought I'd just watch. I saw you go down. I was hiding in that yard. Well, I never. What made you come down into cellars then? I waited ages for you to come back, and you didn't. And then I suddenly heard old Scamper whining like anything down in the coal hole. So I hopped out of my hiding place and came down the rope ladder. Scamper led me here. But what on earth has happened? It's too long a story to tell you now, George. Take a look around and see if you can see any keys anywhere. Let's hope to goodness that old man didn't take them with him. There are some keys on this nail. Hang on, I'll see if one of them fits. Yes, you're in luck! Ah, oh, that's better. Good old George, and good old Scamper too. If it wasn't for him, we might never have been found. Now, come on. We've got to get to the police station and tell our story to Inspector Harris. It's up to the police now. We've done all we can. The following evening, after tea, there was a very special meeting of the Secret Seven, and this time there were two unexpected visitors. And so that's it. Another mystery solved. We've each had one bit of the jigsaw, and we found they fitted together. We saw what the picture was. We each did our bit. Even old George, who isn't even... Can I come in? I guess you'd have a Secret Seven meeting this evening. And my father says I can be a member again if you'll have me. Hey! hey! You see, Inspector Harris came to ask me a few questions, and he told Dad that all the Secret Seven are quite remarkable people. 
and Dad never said a word about having turned me out. And after the inspector had gone, Dad said I could ask the Secret Seven to make me a member again. So here I am. We mm -hmm. solemnly make you a member, George. Yes, yes. yes. Scamper, we told you you were only temporary, didn't we? So you won't mind George taking your place. But you were very, very good as a member, wasn't he, everybody? Yes. yes. If you hadn't gone to fetch George to the rescue last night, Peter, Colin and Jack would still be locked up in that dog cage. Who is it? I'm afraid I don't know the password. It's Jack Spratt. We'll soon have to choose a new one, though, so it doesn't matter telling you. Come in, Inspector. Thank you. I thought you ought to know the results of the good work done by this remarkable society. We got the car and the dogs at Pilbury. And we'd never have traced it if you hadn't remembered the number of the car you saw. PSD 188L. Pretty sick dog! <laughs> <laughs> what? That's how we remember the number, Inspector. Pretty sick dog. PSD. Oh. Oh, I see. <laughs> Yes, anyway, you were right in your guess. The car that you saw the poodle in did belong to Hobson, the man in the cellar. He's got a garage at Pilbury, and that's where he'd put the dogs. Goodness knows how many dogs he's stolen and sold. Oh, and we also got the old caretaker fellow, Pace. He's a poor old stick, a bit feeble-minded, but clever enough to help a dog stealer, it seems. Oh, we got Taylor, too, down at Starlings. Oh, he's a bad lot. He and Hobson ran this dog-stealing business between them. Covered their tracks all the time and bamboozled us nicely. But they couldn't bamboozle the Secret Seven, could they? <laughs> oh, well, I must be off. Uh, thank you again for your help. Bye, bye, bye Inspector. Bye. Bye. Well, there's our new password. What? What? what are you talking about? Bamboozle. Nobody would ever guess a word like bamboozle. How about it? Yes. Oh, great. Yes. Well, now everything's settled. What about a round of ice creams? I've got my Saturday money. I'll treat you all. <coughs> yes, and you too, Scamper. If anyone has earned an ice cream, it's you. So there go the Secret Seven out into the sunshine. Another mystery solved, another adventure over. But I bet there's another one just around the corner. Don't you?